So the heavens have been split in two and fire is poured down. We talked about that last night. It swallowed up the sacrifice that was on that altar. And then, as it was just talked about in the video, the heavens are split in two again and rain pours down. A drought that has been going on in the Middle Eastern world for three years suddenly comes to an end. And then as was also pointed out in the video, there is this really wonderful moment where it says it is by the power of the hand of God that Elijah starts to run even ahead of Ahab to get to Jezreel. And Jezreel is where Jezebel lives. And the reason why I think the hand of God is there and it's just carrying him along and Elijah wants to get there is because Elijah's excited to get there ahead of Ahab because once Ahab gets there and he pours out the news about the pouring out of the fire and the pouring out of the rain and about the slaughter of 850 prophets that Jezebel is going to turn around and recognize who the one true God is. All the people are going to turn. Everything's going to be great except this is what happens. This is 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 1. And Ahab arrived, and he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say this, Oh, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of those dead prophets. And Elijah was afraid, you think? <laughs> He was afraid, and he runs for the second time, but this time it says Elijah ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, the first of many statements here about how desperate he's feeling. He left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came to a broom bush. It's a common bush in the Middle Eastern desert. He came to a broom bush. He sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, because I am no better than my ancestors. I'm no better than any prophet that's come before me. And then he lay down under that broom bush, and he fell asleep, hoping he would never have to open his eyes again. Now, I am not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a counselor, but still in my professional opinion, I will say, I don't think Elijah's doing too hot right now, is he? I mean, you think about the things that he is saying here, deep within him, the text tells us that he just wants to die. In fact, when he sits underneath this bush, he cries out to God, would you just please take my life because I have had enough. I'm going to go over to this broom bush. I'm going to go underneath it in the shade of it. I'm going to fall asleep, and I never want to wake up. He stumbled into profound anxiety. He is being crushed by depression. The man is desperate, and who can blame him, right? I mean, you think about the journey that Elijah has been on up to this point. I mean, from the very start, he is called by God to serve as a prophet in the shadow of the most wicked king that Israel has ever known. And that most wicked king that Israel has ever known goes off and marries Jezebel, who's the most evil woman the world has ever known. And these folks begin to systematically pick off all of the prophets that were supposed to stand there alongside of Elijah. They begin to slaughter them. A hundred prophets are having to be hidden into caves. Elijah is in such a desperate situation at one point he has to have birds feed him. He has to trust a miraculous thing with the widow. Then he gets yelled at. We didn't talk about this yesterday, but there's a moment where the son of that widow actually dies and she blames Elijah. She rails against him. He has this hatred thrown at him, and even when he resurrects her son through the power of God, still people are wondering, who is this joker? And then he goes back, and he has to stare down 850 prophets, and then the heavens open up, it pours down fire, it pours down rain, and he thinks the moment has come, but no, now there's a bounty on his head. And Jezebel says, far be it from me if by tomorrow you're not dead, buddy. I think you'd have anxiety too. A little bit of depression, a little bit of despair. And it's in this moment, of course, what what Elijah so desperately needs in his desperation is for someone to sustain him. You know what sustain means? I mean, the classic Webster dictionary definition. 
It is when someone steps into your life and they seek to strengthen you physically and mentally because you are out on both counts. Someone who will step into your life and do something so that you can be transformed by the renewing of your physical strength, so that you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this is exactly what God begins to do for Elijah in his most desperate moment. We've been on this journey and we started here by saying we can trust that God provides because he is Real. We now step a little bit further into the story with Elijah. And as Coach has already pointed out, we recognize that when we step into the story and there are moments of despair, when it seems that evil has swallowed up good, when it seems that darkness has actually been the one to make the light tremble and to flee, that in these moments when we despair, God will sustain. We see this in the life of Elijah. God sustains him Physically, he strengthens him physically. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this this morning because, frankly, we covered this yesterday, but I don't want to ignore this. I don't want to skip this. We really make our way back to the first point that we can trust that God will provide. In our despair, he does more of the same. That's one of the things maybe you noticed when I was reading the text because it goes on. Where Actually, I haven't read this part yet. Let me go on because this is what happens. God begins to sustain him physically because it says just in that moment when he says, take my life, I want to die, all at once the text says, an angel touched him and said, get up, Elijah, eat. And Elijah looked around, and there by his head was some bread that had been baked over hot coals and a jar of water, and so he ate and he drank. And if you recognize the language there, you you should recognize it. It sounds like 1 Kings 17. It's the stuff of the widow and that little splash of oil and the pinch of flour. Once again, what God is saying is, I know now you're in your most desperate moment and you wonder how I will sustain you. I'm going to do it again and again and again. Look, I've baked another loaf of bread for you. I'm providing water. It's like what the ravens did, what 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 the widow did, what that brook in the Kareth Ravine did for you. I'm here to sustain you physically. I mean, there's few things, let's be honest, that are more powerful than just the beauty of of, of a meal, of the sustenance of a meal in our grief and in our despair. And God sweats the small stuff of a meal like that. The power of those acts, the power of food. Now, I was thinking about that, the power of food and these small things that sustain us. The, the very first date that I ever went on with my wife at the very end of that date, before I left, she goes, oh, hey, here, I made this for you. And it was a box of cookies, not just cookies, cookies with icing. Not just cookies with icing, but they had sprinkles. And it was our first date, and yet I looked at her and I said, thank you, and will you marry me? It's a power sometimes of these smallest of things that just speak volumes to us. And man, in moments of despair, in these moments where you bump up against a wall of evil and you feel like it has made all of the light tremble and to flee, I I can't guarantee again, kind of like yesterday morning, that you are going to wake up in the morning when you've cried out to God to deliver you even unto death if need be. I can't guarantee you'll wake up, oh, well, look, behold, bread and water. But once again, the church... And we tell so many awful stories about the church and it's so unfair because honestly, I think if we are honest for every terrible story, sometimes we have a hundred more of the beauty of what the church has done for us. And I can remember in 2011 when my dad passed away, it's who I was closest to in life outside of my wife. And it was at the most desperate time in our lives. We were looking to plant a church on the west side of Indianapolis. And I said this before, church planting is so extremely hard and trying. And we were trying to raise support and we were trying to get money. And it wasn't coming in. It was just dribbling in. We didn't have any wonderful story about some huge big gift. And we were having trouble getting people to sign on to be a part of the launch team. And then in the middle of that, my dad dies after this struggle with stage four cancer. And it's the person that I turned to for everything in my life. And I spiraled into depression. I mean, there were moments of anxiety, panic attacks that I had. What does this mean? What does this look like? I turned to my wife and I said, we can't do this. We can't plant a church. I can't do it. I'm done. Lord, I've had enough. 
And it got so bad for me that I feel like I couldn't even put one foot in front of the other, let alone have to, for example, mow the lawn. My lawn looked like a jungle. First of all, I didn't have a lawnmower. We didn't have money to go buy one. But I didn't even have the energy to want to go to the store and figure out which one to buy. But it did. It looked like a jungle. There were probably bears living in my lawn at this point. But a knock at the door, and it's Aaron, my neighbor across the street. And so he just comes over and he says, can I mow your lawn? Now, if, if you don't know Aaron, you might think that's kind of passive aggressive. No. <laughs> Aaron's a good dude. Aaron knew about that. And man, sometimes as a church, we go and we always tell people, man, if there's anything that I can do for you in your time of desperation, just let me know. Let's stop that. Come up with something and do it. And that's what Aaron did. And it's the beauty of God speaking in despair in which he said, I will sustain you in your despair. In the most physical, tangible, I will sweat the small stuff that you continue to step into the story. But remember when we define sustaining and the power of what sustaining is, it is not just that we are strengthened physically, it is also that we are strengthened mentally. We have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and allow God to do that for us. Because being strengthened physically wasn't actually enough for Elijah. Because after he gets the bread and that little jar of water, it says he ate and he drank, but the second half of verse 6 said, and then he laid down again. <laughs> It's like, you know what? I still would like to lay down under this brush over here, and I hope I don't wake up. But thanks for the bread and the water. But the angel of the Lord, verse 7, came back a second time and touched him and said, no, no, get up and eat, for there's a journey for you to go on, and it's too much for you. And so, okay, Elijah got up. He ate. He drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached, this is important, Horeb. The mountain of God. But there, I love this. So he had the, the bush he was hiding under, but even there he's like, oh good, a cave. And it said, and he found a cave and he lodged there. <laughs> and yet God, the word of the Lord, came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here on Mount Horeb in this cave, hiding in this cave in your despair? And Elijah, has, Elijah really in this moment, he does. If you go on in the verse, he loses his mind with God. What do you mean what am I doing here? For goodness sakes, so you opened up the heavens and you poured down fire and you poured down rain. We slaughter 850 prophets. You send me over to Jezreel at the gates of Jezebel and you made me look like a fool. She sends out a bounty on my head to strike me down dead. And she's able to do it. She's already struck down hundreds of other prophets. What do you mean, what am I doing here? There's no better place for me to be than in a cave in the midst of this despair. What am I doing here? What are you doing? What am I doing here? God, what are you doing there or over there? Where are you? And yet when God asks this question, what are you doing here, Elijah? He asks this on, on two different levels, and we'll get to the second one, but the first one is this. I actually think he's asking it in a very loving and teasing things out of Elijah way. Elijah, what brought you here to Mount Horeb? Not the cave where you're hiding in your despair. What made you think if you go anywhere, you go to Mount Horeb? Anyone know what Mount Horeb is? See, we don't pay attention to geography in the Bible, and we should. Mount Horeb is also known as what? Mount Sinai. That sound familiar? What that is? It's the mountain of God. It's where God visited Moses in the presence of his people. But what's even more important about that, and I think this is tied into the fact that it says for 40 days and nights, Elijah had to make his way there. What God is doing here is he's telling a story to Elijah that he might be transformed by the telling of the story. Elijah stepped in the story, but God recognizes that sometimes he will work with us, so we listen to the story, we hear the story before we step back into it, because we need to. And it doesn't say that God sent Elijah to Horeb. It's almost as if God is saying, what drew you here? It's because Elijah knew where he needed to go. He needed to go somewhere where it told him a story that had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And is there a more powerful one for him in his despair than the story of Moses? Moses. 
You talk about Ahab and Jezebel, they're a joke in comparison to Pharaoh. The world power in the ancient Near East was Egypt, and the ruler of it was Pharaoh. Pharaoh struck down children among the Israelites so that there would be no one who would come up and rise up against him. And yet God, through the very first of prophets, Elijah's a prophet way down the line, but the story's being told him of the very prophet, the very first one, Moses, who steps in in his own fear and trembling, and God in his power through Moses lays low world powers, breaks the back of Pharaoh to the point where he sets the people loose. He sends them out. He pushes them out. And even when he then pursues them because Pharaoh thinks he's made a mistake, God will part the waters, God's people will cross over, and he crashes it over Pharaoh to swallow them up. And it's on Mount Horeb that God calls forward Moses and he gives him the commandments and he speaks to the people there because he says, look what I have done for you and now you enter into the promised land. Your story, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end because death is contained and evil is contained. All the world powers that set themselves against me are contained. In your despair, you lose sight of that. And the reason you've come to Mount Horeb, God is saying to Elijah, is because you need to hear that story again. Because there's nothing worse than being in the middle of a story, is there? You know, it's funny, when I heard the theme for this summer was to be continued. What's, what's hilarious is that's kind of a trigger phrase for me. I think the phrase to be continued is annoying. <laughs> I mean, think about when that shows up at the end of television shows or at the end of a movie. They don't do that as much anymore. But when I was a little kid and at the end of a television show, it said, to be continued, I wanted to punch the TV. Because when it says to be continued, you're in the middle of the worst possible moment for these folks. It's the same way with movies. We're all feeling good now because we've seen Endgame. But think back to a year ago. It didn't say to be continued, but that was a to be continued moment. And you're like, Spider-Man dissolved into, was that gnats? And he's just gone. Like, what's happening? It's annoying, but even more than that, it's terrifying. For you to be in the middle of your story, in the middle of despair, is terrifying because you don't know the ending. And in this moment, the way that God sustains you is not just physically, but mentally. One of the greatest gifts that God has given you outside of his son, outside of the living word, is the written word. And this isn't just something that's very important for Elijah to look back on the story of Moses and to recognize that evil always eventually trembles and flees in the face of God. It's important for us to look back on these stories. It's why we have this. As as I sometimes say this to folks, man, you need to, at the very least, need to read 43% of the Bible. Now, I know that sounds weird, like, I don't have to read 100%. Great. No, you should read 100% of it, but at the very least, 43% of it. Because about 43% of the Bible is story. It's narrative. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. And all of these stories, the arc of them, bend toward God's victory. And you need to hear that every day. And especially in your despair. Because as, uh, as, as, as Elijah had the story of Moses to sustain him and he was transformed by the renewing of his mind. And he stands there on Mount Horeb. It's the same thing for us when we today, in our own moment, on a mountain, in a holy moment with God, we get to look back on the story of Elijah. And right now he's in the middle of it, a to be continued moment. But we have his whole story. The beginning, the middle, and the end. And we know that when he's sent back out, that he still has to have some despairing moments. I mean, the guy has to anoint kings and prophets, which is a profound statement against the other kings of that age. He still has to stare down an army of 50. He has to proclaim death sentences to both Ahab and Jezebel. But it's in that that's powerful because we know the rest of the story. He is terrified here of Ahab and Jezebel and what evil is doing through them. But there is a moment in 1 Kings 21 where he stands before Ahab and he says, you will go to war, you will die, and the dogs will lick up your blood from the street. And another moment he says, Jezebel, you too will one day die and dogs in the street will eat your body. The Bible's pretty interesting, isn't it? 
And that is exactly how it plays out in the later chapters of 1 Kings and the beginning of 2 Kings. Ahab dies in battle, and the blood from his wound, it fills the chariot, and when they cleanse it out, the blood goes out into the streets and the dogs lap it up. Jezebel is thrown from a tower and dies from the fall, and they only find, I think it says, her skull, her hands, and her feet. The dogs have eaten her. Because evil is contained and the kingdoms that set themselves against the kingdom of God, they will rise, but they will fall. And this is the arc of the story again and again and again and again. Which is why in the moments for Elijah and in the moments for us, When we rest in this cave and we are terrified, we begin to recognize that the cave that we lodge on is lodged within a mountain where great victories have been proclaimed again and again and again in the name of God. And the question comes from God, what are you doing here? And he's not just asking this question to say, Elijah, what drew you to Mount Horeb? But he's also saying, what are you still doing here in that cave? Go. Step back into the story. Because you know the stories of old that tell you how the story of now ends. And how every story written by God will always and ever end. When we despair, God sustains. Let's stand and worship.